growth pains. Hey everyone, welcome to this new episode of Growth Pains, uh, where we talk about how we all struggle uh, when trying to grow our businesses. I'm your host, Ignacio Gallegos, also known as Nacho. Today, we'll be talking about topics such as disrupting industries with traditional mindsets, having more good ideas that you can implement, hiring at speed, and finding time for yourself. My guest today is Lubomila Jordanova. She's the founder at Plan A, a Berlin-based startup that is helping companies measure, reduce, and report on their business carbon footprint using science and machine learning. So welcome, Lubomila. How are you? Hi, I'm doing great. I'm doing really good. Do you want to add something to that bio? I think from all the guests I've had, uh, I'm really happy to have a guest that is trying to change the world for the best because uh, <laughs> not everybody in the software industry aims for that. So do you want to add something to what you guys do with Plan A? That would be really interesting. The philosophy behind Plan A is uh, to enable individuals and businesses to act on climate change. And how we do this is through the different tools that we have developed. We have the software that you mentioned. We also have a huge community uh, where the different actors, the different stakeholders engage with one another to push forward and faster uh, this change that needs to happen in order for our planet to be healthy again. Yeah, yeah, super cool. I, 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 I was looking at you guys online and, and it's really interesting uh, to, to see how the software can really accurately predict uh, all of these really complex things, right? It's, it's not that easy. And, and the first step like all of us that do software that measure something, the first step is measuring to, to change anything. So it's a really cool product. Um, to get it started, I want to start with a little bit of a true or false, which in your case is a bit more focused on the environmental stuff. But I wanted to hear your take on some of these. So just short answers and, and we can walk through to, to the pains. The first one. So trying to convince people about the importance of climate change with apocalyptic statistics does not work. True or false? True. true. <laughs> you couldn't wait for that one. Yeah. Tell me a little bit more about that, because that's all we hear, right? We're going to get flooded and I'm going to lose my property and all that kind of stuff. For the many years now that I've been dealing with this topic, I've learned a lot about the mindset of a human, the psychology of a human, and um, what motivates us and what empowers us is the idea that uh, we have the capacity to change something. And how can I empower you if I tell you that there's this huge wave uh, of different natural disasters coming yeah. your way that is physically bigger than you, metaphorically bigger than you? Um, you can't. Um, and people get excited by the idea that they can be part of a change. And as long as you give them the right tools and the place, the, the space where they can work with one another, then yeah. they become um, essentially the power that we need to address climate change. So we work only with positivity, and this has been since day one what Plan A offers. Yeah, I think also because basically what you say there is that, you know, people think like if I'm screwed anyway, why bother, right? Like that's, that's one notion. But you know what's, what's interesting of what the times we're living in right now is that with this pandemic, like we have been given ways to help, right? Like we say, hey, wear a mask, whatever you can do to help. And you still see people that just say, yeah, I know better, right? And, uh, and it doesn't do anything. So I guess you, you're gonna, you face that anyways, right? A little bit with, with climate change. Do you see a lot of people that are still thinking this is hocus pocus and hoax and whatever they can think? I think like with every issue and with every topic, there's uh, multiple uh, views, opinions even. Um, and... It's totally fine. Uh, revolutions or changes do not happen thanks to uh, everyone getting involved. They happen by a big proportion of society waking up to a particular fact reality. And uh, these are the people we need to focus on. Um, yeah. I spend my time uh, on people that have already been uh, convinced by the existence of climate change and need the support to get going with the topic. Yeah. Okay, let's go to the second one. So it is possible to connect purpose and business. True or false? True. Do you deal with that a lot with the companies you work with? Do you think they are... or Well, here's the thing, right? So, well, we're going to get to it a, a bit more in, the, in depth in the topics, but I, I think it is possible to connect them because you can tie the business results to the purpose, but not because the purpose is as important as the business. Or, you know what I mean? 
We're still on the verge between understanding whether uh, purpose came first or the profit came first, like kind of the chicken egg problem in business. Yeah. Um, and the businesses that have decided that purpose should be always part of what also defines profit uh, are the ones that have aligned to the needs of their employees, to the needs of their customers, um, and also to a more um, kind of purposeful existence that contributes to a bigger good. Um, I think that in 10 years' time, uh, we're going to be seeing no other businesses than those that combine these two elements. Uh, but for the time being, I guess uh, there's still uh, space for uh, solely profit to be a driving uh, source of factor. And it's understandable because these are the fundamental elements of a system that has been built over decades. Yeah. Um, so now going through the shift is obviously taking uh, some time, I guess. Yeah, of course, of course. Okay, the, the next one. Growing a tech business, a green tech business, is no different than any other B2B software business. True or false? Mm, true, but. Uh, so uh -huh. I would definitely say, uh, yes, you need to focus on the metrics. You need to focus on exactly these elements that make a SaaS business successful. Uh, but you also need to understand what kind of externalities come from your business. A true, successful, and also impactful in a positive manner, green business is one that understands all the elements of its existence and how they potentially could have negative, negative side effects. Um, I'll give a more practical example. Um, as a sustainable uh, SaaS business, we need to be looking into designing our product sustainably, making yeah. it less um, emission heavy, uh, less energy intensive. Uh, um, and these little elements go on top of the usual metrics that you ask for uh, yeah. when you talk about s software businesses. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, even even for software that is not aimed towards environmental benefit, right? Like like usual software, a lot of your large customers are just calling in and saying, "What are your policies with the environment?" Because I cannot have any vendor attached to my business that doesn't have any good green policies, right? Even if you do something completely different as you know whatever kind of software, so. It's definitely becoming a trend. Okay, the last one. So we now believe that we will learn from COVID, but most likely scenario is that once this is over, we'll go back to money first, sustainability second. True or false? I think this year has been a pivotal um, moment in the human history, uh, allowing us to see through a different lens the opportunities and also uh, challenges that we face as a society. Uh, COVID has not been only COVID. COVID has also been uh, a moment when we've reduced by 0.7% the emissions on the planet. It's been uh, a time when we decided uh, to test ourselves in uh, kind of improving. There hasn't been a time uh, as of such in the last decades that uh, people have asked for so much um, help in terms of uh, kind of growth and development. Uh, so I wouldn't think that we c can ever go back to whatever normal was uh, mm -hmm. because it's not going to be possible. Um, I definitely think that there is a lot of need in people's minds for a bit more freedom and we're definitely going to reclaim that, uh, probably going out, traveling a bit more uh, and so on, which is absolutely within the expected realm of activities, but normal is never going to exist because sustainability took a big place of 2020 in terms of discussions. There was a moment when uh, we could have still be debating whether sustainability was going to become um, a fad, yeah. the next thing that disappears. Uh, but I would say post-June, uh, post the announcement of the Green Deal, post a few other uh, political and also business moments, uh, this is not possible. Yeah, there's no point of return already, right? It's already too Absolutely, much of an yeah. impactful change. All right, so let's start before we dive into the pains with talking about one thing that you think that you are really bad at, that you consider that you're really bad at when it comes to work. Um, I think finding still a balance between uh, what is a successful good amount of a workload per day uh, yeah. 
versus what is not is still somewhat of a challenge for me. I always think that everything is a priority and um, this leads to a lot of working over the weekends. It leads to basically losing aspects of the balance that I believe are quite necessary for a human to be healthy and happy and stable and balanced. Um, So this is still something I'm working on. Um, There is also a problem in the fact that I'm very driven by what I do. I love my job. I love my team. And uh, it always feels like everything is super important. We need to deliver now. Um, But I go back to this peace of mind uh, here and there. And when I catch myself there, I do remember that balance is the most important thing uh, we need to fight for in life. Yeah, yeah, we're definitely going to talk about that in detail a little bit further than the conversation. So, so that's a, a point we're going to go much deeper. But the first pain you mentioned was the disrupting industries that have a more traditional mindset, right? When it comes to reducing the carbon footprint, um, the way to really create impact here is to work with very, very large, often very traditional businesses, right? On how to try to change the way they've done things for decades. So what are some of the struggles you've faced along the way in this area? I think when you're trying to change someone's mind, uh, there's a bit of a um, problem with the fact that people make up their minds on what their decision is within the first seven seconds of a conversation. Mm -hmm. Uh, This might sound like a shocking fact, but the truth is is that uh, you can't convince anyone in anything if they don't go into the conversation with a predisposition uh, to understand a bit more, to learn a bit more, um, and to challenge themselves on how they can implement this project or idea within their own existence. So how we do that is, first of all, we choose quite carefully who we speak to. Uh, We speak to companies that understand um, what it means to truly have impact uh, that is positive for the planet, that understand uh, what is the problem with greenwashing, that understand that sustainability is a journey. It's not something that happens overnight. And um, this really helps us uh, filter out uh, kind of the discussions that could be potentially uh, um, dissatisfying, so to say. But that's that's interesting, right? Because you guys are still, well, it's th- your third year in business, right? But um, it's very tricky when you're, when you're, in a way starting out or like grabbing more traction to say no to things, right? So is this something early on you realized and, and that you do quite a lot or, or is this something that has come in the last months that you've realized that not all conversations are, are good to have? This has been always part of the decision-making process within the company. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're in the business of principles. We're in the business of impact. And what this means is that... Uh, the currency with which we work is science, it's uh, trustworthiness, and also it's uh, honesty and transparency. Uh, if we decide to position ourselves somewhere further than this or say yes to opportunities that are not in alignment to these uh, four principles, uh, we are most likely going to go out of business uh, in a very short amount of time. Um, yeah. We prefer to take this road. It's the longer one. It's the more um, challenging one, uh, but it's definitely the one that is uh, leading to the best results for people, uh, planet, and also for planet itself. What about opening those first doors, right? Because I, I can see all of you guys are really young people, um, and and you know, social proof is everything in the software. You want to say, hey, these guys all come from PhDs in Harvard. They all work with the most amazing scientists in the planet and blah, blah, blah. And here you get a, a group of young people from Berlin saying, hey, we have this software. At the beginning, it might have said like people being like, who the hell are you, right? Like how was that first stage of opening those doors? How did you guys get through? I think there's always been on the planning team a lot of credibility because first of all, we've always had scientists uh, yeah. and they come from these uh, universities uh, yeah. that are the most reputable on the planet. Uh, and the second element was that uh, we've worked really hard to get where we are. Uh, we have been able to uh, define quite clearly uh, um, an agenda and we studiously followed through, uh, basically throughout the years, this agenda to understand a bit better like how we can help companies, 
how it can be more impactful. Um, and after the first few clients, which then you can use as a reference point as well, um, people started recognizing that there's a lot of uh, quality, there's a lot of commitment in our product, uh, which is what at the end of the day, if you really want to have impact, is you're looking for. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine that, you know, coming in these early meetings and just talking about algorithms and, and, and software might have been tricky, right? Because when, when, when these corporates think about reducing their carbon footprint, maybe the first thing that comes to mind is not a piece of software or it's not an algorithm. Or was that more, you know, was, was it easier than you thought? Or what people were like, okay, do we really need an algorithm to tell us how to do this? Was that a, a barrier you had to break? We offer a lot more than a software. Planet's uh, product offering includes a community, it includes a software, but also uh, a human touch to the experience of becoming more sustainable. Uh, we have embedded in the whole user experience a really clear uh, path for success for our clients, making sure that they have the comfort that with this may be uncommon and an unclear topic to them, um, they have a partner that is there to help them, uh, which is a bit different than simply logging in somewhere and then you're out uh, yeah. after you've calculated some emissions. It also makes it tricky in terms of scalability, right? Like you guys, in a way, every software company tries to add a lot of value with their people, with their, with their entire community and so on. But as you scale... Uh, and you don't want to have to hire. Well, maybe you do, but sometimes you don't want to have to scale uh, in a one-to-one -one ratio your customers with your people, right? You want to have hopefully a 30 people company for 2,000 customers. You need to like relate that more and more to the software. Is that something that you guys are aiming towards or do you feel like you're always going to be a bit of a consultancy on the side? We've stopped with the consulting for a long time now. Uh, yeah. Our software is sophisticated enough to be able to do complex work uh, without the need for people. Yeah. Um, the scaling in terms of people is on the community side, and this is where we are growing rapidly. And once you build a solid and uh, really engaged community, uh, they essentially become your ambassadors. They become uh, your representatives if, in times when you're not there. Um, and this is kind of the, the trick or this is the, uh, the way in which we are making sure that we're not doing the one-on-one -on -one, uh, ratio, uh, which I agree with you is not the most um, kind of well-respected way of building a SaaS <laughs> business. Well, I mean, yeah, it, it might be required, right? Like you, you have a, a, a different business. But what's interesting to me is how you guys look at, at you, like client acquisition, Right, which is a very marketing marketing thing, but basically, uh, because as a marketer, what you try to do is like you know define your persona and be like this guy have these job titles, they work in these kind of companies and blah blah blah. But with a solution like yours, it's probably not something you're like just targeting these people with Facebook ads, right? Like you really want to just build uh, momentum in the community, having people referred other businesses. How do you guys look at acquisition? Do you do you do any of like the traditional marketing stuff, or do you just build? around the community and, and, and drive word of mouth? We have the big benefit of having been on the market before sustainability became trendy, cool, or whatever yeah. you call it. Uh, and uh, we've been doing this before there were movements, before there was a lot of buzz about the topic. And this helps us a lot because there's these people that have been with us since day one uh, who have been confirming years ago, the problem of climate change, they knew about it and they were pushing their businesses at a time when it was not so popular. Uh, these are the people that have been the young evangelists, so to say, uh, for Plan A, and this is also the, so to say, acquisition method that we're using up until today. Um, we build strong bonds with multiple, not only communities, but individuals, people who are responsible for sustainability within their companies. Um, and use them as our sparing partner, so to say, uh, to expand the product, but also expand our customer base. Yeah, yeah. What's interesting for me is that, well, the software, like many, right, like offers you to measure your carbon footprint, and at the same time, you guys have like this sort of like task management system in it where you can like you know tick your boxes and make sure you're acting on it. But what I see a lot in this kind of softwares, right, is that a lot of people measure and very little people like take the action. 
in your case, that's super critical, right? Because if you're measuring whatever it is, like employee engagement and you don't take actions, okay. But in your case, it's, it has an impact on like everyone. So um, do you see customers getting stuck at that stage, right? Because it requires so many stakeholders to be aligned. It requires multiple people and blockers. Do you see people being like, okay, amazing. We're measuring everything. This is fantastic. But when it comes to taking action, just going flat. If you are familiar with the science behind emission calculations, you would know that uh, sustainability is everyone's business and sustainability is the result of the engagement of multiple stakeholders within the company. And uh, also uh, with the engagement of stakeholders that are outside of the company because your scope three is actually your suppliers and yeah. or your investments, uh, leased assets and so on. Um, by having understood this is day one, we have embedded this kind of logic into the product uh, where uh, multiple people uh, can claim a part of the transformation or the change that is happening uh, by the use of this product and uh, results in essentially the implementation of sustainability uh, mindset and measures within the company. Um, the people that get stuck normally are uh, people that have uh, gotten the buy-in from the management, but for having the possibility to use our product management is crucial. So uh, there's also kind of a filtering element there as well. Um, we just get basically everyone involved and this is how things uh, happen. Uh, yeah. We empower basically all the different stakeholders to make sure that uh, sustainability happens on a fundamental level rather than on a superficial one. Yeah, and also I guess, you know, like as much as you want everybody to care, also some people care more about what it makes them look like. Like So so, so one of the questions I had for you, and this one might put you a bit, a bit on the spot, but do you think that big corporates are truly interested on reducing carbon footprint or they are seeing the PR benefit of reducing carbon footprint, right? Because it's, it makes you look great. And in a way, there's even business cases. And you, as you said, maybe in 10 years from now, you will not be able to exist if you don't adapt now. Uh, but today, do you think it's more of a PR move or it's like a true care for, for, for sustainability? Regardless of what is the thinking behind it, uh, big corporates are understanding that there's multiple things at stake for them. Um, there's, mm -hmm. there's employees, uh, people actually are leaving their jobs because their companies do not have sustainability uh, commitments. Um, there's their customers. These are the people who are asking for sustainability lines of products and so on. Um, you can take multiple examples from fashion, from cars, anywhere. And then the final aspect, which probably is uh, quite key, is um, investors uh, and then also regulators. Um, regardless if they're doing it for um, having concern for the planet uh, or for the future of their kids uh, or because they feel pressured from these other stakeholders, the end sum is yeah. good for the planet and this is what we care about. Where we don't get engaged and where it gets problematic for us is when you have uh, fake commitments, uh, which are uh, these greenwashing practices that unfortunately even up until today we see in big chunks. For example, um, without going into too much depth about the science, carbon neutrality is quite of a complex uh, moment in a company's history. If you really want to get to a carbon neutral moment, um, mm -hmm. you need to have calculated all of your scopes of emissions, scope one, two, and three, which means that you would have collected all the data from your suppliers, uh, you would have analyzed all of your leased assets, all of your transportation, logistics, and so on. Um, it's immense piece of work. And when someone that comes from, uh, let's say, a 50,000-person company or company with 100 markets, uh, Imagine this exercise being multiplied by the amount of the markets because in every single country, conversion factors are different. Um, the calculations are different. Most likely the suppliers are different as well. Um, so this is, for example, one, uh, one case where uh, the, this is the problem of commitment uh, uh, and impact becomes a bit blurred. Yeah. No, I can imagine. I can imagine. And when it comes to convincing these people to, to get going, because, you know, in a normal sales process, 
marketing and sales are trying to convince you to please, please use us, right? And we're gonna see what what point kind of like works better for you. This is the benefit that that feels better for your company or whatnot. Are you guys in that train, or do you feel like if there's no interest, then then we don't have interest either? Because there's a pressure to grow your business, right? And you want to acquire new customers. But also, maybe in this particular scenario, you don't want to push people that are not really all in, right? What's yeah. your take on that? The good thing is that the market is uh, engaged already enough to allow us to, pick. to be selective about yeah. who we work with. And this has made our lives a lot easier because we don't need to knock on 300 doors to get uh, one contract signed. Uh, actually, yeah. we have a lot more demand than... Uh, we probably has quadrupled just over the last month. Uh, yeah. Just because there's so much interest in the topic and companies are waking up to the reality that there will be long-term negative effects on their business if they don't engage now. Um, so yeah, we can, we can pick and choose. That's good. That's really good. Okay, so moving on to the second pain, right? You were talking about having more ideas that you can implement. I'm curious, on which side of the business do you mean? Is this development, marketing, customer success, is like the particular area where you feel like this more? I've always been uh, incredibly excited about the topic that we tackle because our approach is really unique. And with having this unique approach, we've tested a lot of different uh, ways in which we can engage individuals, businesses, uh, uh, governments even, uh, on how... Uh, they can give us their buy-in for engagement with the topic. Uh, but all of these different ideas are essentially a separate project. And uh, yeah. since the beginning of Plan A, we've had a donation platform. We've had um, more than 50 events, 15,000 people at our events. We've had, we have an academy still. Uh, we have so many different projects that we've started and... Uh, I, I look forward to the moment when um, we're going to be able to kind of implement multiple elements of these projects into the software itself. Um, but as a typical journey of a company, uh, obviously you need to be a bit more careful with where you put your resources yeah. so that you maximize the opportunity that is sitting in front of your uh, kind of uh, in front of your company at this particular moment uh, and at this moment of time the focus is the software um, and kind of expanding features on it but we're going to get back to some of the other elements I'm sure uh, in uh, in uh, some time soon yeah but even even if it is within the software right it, it, it softwares are very complex and one of the things that that is uh, you know a trap I guess is that you tend to want to do everything when most successful companies really obsess about a few really really key things rather than on like saying, hey, I want to add a thousand features to the product. Um, are these ideas clear in your head? Like if you, I was grab you in a hallway in the coffee machine and be like, hey, what are the three things you guys are focusing on right now? Is that something that you're very clear about or is something that gets fuzzy, uh, you know, and, and ever-changing kind of thing? I think a company is an evolving organism. You can't uh, stick to three things every single day for the rest of your existence. Uh, but we, as a company of 30 plus people in, uh, um, in a moment when it's really crucial for us to kind of scale properly, uh, achieve financial results, we have been obsessing uh, with uh, a few elements of the product in particular and uh, without telling much about them, because uh, um, <laughs> it's, it's something that is uh, going to be also announced in, uh, in some weeks from now. Um, we are particularly focusing on, I would say not three, but five things uh, mm -hmm. that are going to be really visible on the product uh, with the clear understanding of what the customer needs, because uh, by now we have a few hundred clients on our product and uh, they have very clearly identified for us what drives them, what engages them with the product, and what is most important for them when they want uh, achievements within the sustainability topic. Yeah, yeah. And another trade-off, I, I think that's that's really common when you're building the product, is that you're torn within, like, should I put more effort and resources into features that are going to get me more customers? So the things that people ask me, if you had this, I would join you. Or in the things that are going to make my current customers 
uh, happier or get more value out of the product. Is this a trade-off you, you found or do you find like those usually align with you guys? We try to balance between these two things because at the end of the day, if you have clients that have already trusted you, they've paid you, they've given uh, their time for your product, then uh, they are definitely the ones you should be uh, focusing on engaging and keeping satisfied for as long as possible. Hopefully, uh, um, until they've kind of covered all of their needs with the product uh, and starting to use it essentially as a day-to-day -to -day tool. Um, but given the fact that kind of the product is uh, still at the stage where it's developing at really high speed, uh, we are listening also to the potential customers and seeing what gets to be repeated multiple times as a, yeah. um, as a topic and make sure that it's on the roadmap. And when it comes to prioritizing the roadmap, do you guys have some sort of, a, are you guys very strict about, you know, your criteria and you do rankings? What, what, what kind yeah. of like, what does your process look like? We have a prioritization process and uh, actually I can't speak highly enough of uh, our product manager, Louis, uh, who is a phenomenal uh, uh, mind, uh, who has been keeping us really disciplined, uh, making sure hey, it's that... It's not always easy. Huh? <laughs> you, you, need one, yeah. you need a strickler in the team that is like, guys. Yeah. yeah. He's, uh, he's, the, he's our army chief. <laughs> yeah. uh, he's keeping us intact and uh, we have a very clear understanding of what when needs to happen because you just end up losing resources if you don't follow a plan. Yeah, yeah. You also mentioned that that one of your pains which caught my attention was hiring at speed. I mean, we've talked about this in the podcast before. Uh, I had a person from, from Miro also talking about it and they're just like doubling, tripling uh, sizes and stuff like that. But you guys are a bit different, right? Like you guys are like 30 people now. Uh, and what does the hiring plan look like for 2021? Are you really looking at hiring in, in, in volumes or what's your take on that one moving forward? So we doubled only over the last three months, uh, oh, wow. the company, uh, even more than doubled since the beginning of the, of the year. And we're planning on this, doing the same thing for 2021. Um, we are quite picky uh, with who gets in, in the company. Uh, we have a very clear and complex process on hiring and, uh, we do a lot of tests, uh, checks for culture fit, uh, and also for alignment in terms of values. Uh, and all of these things are time consuming, but we believe are crucially important to secure that there's no turnover, um, that people don't leave, that we don't ask them to leave. Yeah. Um, so yes, we are hiring at speed. <laughs> but, but that's super interesting, right? Because you, 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 you mentioned something that, I mean, you hear a lot of CEOs saying things like, well, you need certain people at certain times, right? So at the beginning, I hope I can get like really good acquisition people. And then after a year, I'll be fine there. And maybe I'll need some other people, right? And they're like, a lot of people in tech are like, okay, you'll just go stage by stage hiring what you need. But you're from the beginning of, the, of, of your hiring process, you're already thinking about building something long-term, like people actually sticking around for a while. Uh, what do you see as a while? Because tenure in, in startups right now, you know, two years is the new 10. What, 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 how long would you like people to stick around? Um, up until now, from the company, we've only had uh, two people leave. Um, and in three years, this yeah. is, uh, And many of the people that have been there since the beginning are now... Um, the C-level people within the company. Uh, so for what we're building, it's really crucial to have an understanding of longevity because the product we are aiming on building is one that would serve companies for decades. And uh, this is the mindset that we have embedded into the product development uh, and kind of the setup also of um, our features and the product roadmap but also in the hiring process, because I think the best companies that I know of, and I'm sure you also have experience with uh, all of the people you've spoken with um, and you've worked with, are the ones that understand what long-term thinking means and how the evolution of this long-term thinking uh, and engagement on a long-term basis in terms of people, in terms of product development, uh, leads to quality. Um, so this is how I think about it. Um, 
happy to be uh, disagreed with, but that's no. uh, at least the mindset of plenty. No, I actually really agree with you. I think it's a, but it, but it's a common widespread thing that people are, you know, became commodities at some point, and people were just changing people like they were changing shoes. And I, I definitely, if I were in your shoes, I would try to build something a bit more longer term. I think that's that's the right way. Um, what about because we're talking about business versus purpose, right? And and when it comes to people, there's also th that debate about skills versus culture, right? And very often you can find you know that brilliant jerk or people that are really good at what they do but are not that great to be around. Um, how how do you balance that? How important you know is culture more important than skills to you? Is it the other way around? Is it fifty fifty? How do you see that? I think people end up working together better and end up showing more of their skills only if they're in an environment where they're being respected, they're given space uh, to grow and also to put out their own ideas, uh, but also where there's also engagement and uh, where there is alignment between the different mindsets. When it comes to culture for planning, this is something really crucial. Um, we haven't taken anyone on the company uh, team uh, if they don't have a true concern for the health of our planet. I don't like working with jerks. I think uh, it makes your life complicated. It makes yep. you angry. It makes you annoyed. Uh, I don't have time for that. I don't think anyone should have time for that. Uh, and we believe that there has to be a good balance like between the skills and the culture fit. Um, and we've seen it through interview processes where someone comes with the perfect CV but ends up just being uh, disliked because they have too much ego. Yeah. Uh, these are things that don't work in Plan A. And um, like with every company, we have our own uh, kind of way of being, mindset, quirkiness, uh, weirdness even you would call it. Uh, <laughs> ours is focused on uh, kindness, uh, sense of humor, uh, and also uh, ambition. Yeah, but that's really good. And and I think one of the other challenges is that, you know, the interview process is fairly short. Like even if you do it over two months, three months or whatever, the the time you get to spend with that person really is like, I don't know, three, four hours tops before they come in your company. And in an interview, everybody's kind of playing a role, right? You're kind of like being your best self and you're not going to get mad in an interview or you're not going to be an idiot over an interview. So if you see red flags, Uh, have you hired somebody and seen red flags in the first month, in the first two, and pay no attention? Because in my experience, uh, I always tend to think like, oh, but I can coach them. Everybody can get better, everybody. And at some point I've learned with experience that when you see some red flags, but specifically about culture and other things, it's better to pull the plug as soon as you can and just find the better way for everybody and say, hey, you're not for me, we're not for you, we'll help you, whatever it is. Have you been in this position? And if not, I think you probably will be as you double your team. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Are you are you quick on on reacting to those things, or are you one of those people that feel like, "Ooh, I can change them," and then ended up regretting it a year after? I don't think it's uh, my job or uh, the job of anyone on the team to try to change people in a, a fundamental way where you turn them from someone that is negative into positive. Uh, mm -hmm. These are elements of work that uh, have to be uh, part of your maybe journey as a, uh, as a young professional. Uh, but for the environment that we're building, we prefer to n not even hire these people which have shown red flags during the interview process. We have the amazing benefit of uh, always being over flooded with a lot of um, applications. applications, even speculative ones. Uh, And quite often from people that are um, really interesting profiles, um, which allows us to actually pick uh, quite well people that have a good balanced character, one that is uh, without ego, without uh, disagreement element where you're constantly negative. Uh, yeah. um, and these are the people we prefer to prefer to take um, So far, so good, I would say. Uh, you haven't had that. What, yeah. uh, Because yeah. it's tricky, right? Because in, in the interview is one thing and, and sometimes you see zero red flags, but then as month two or month one, you start seeing some and then it's like, you know, people feel this pressure of like, well, do I want to tell everybody that we have to start hiring from scratch and look like an idiot for hiring the wrong person? Right? Also how it makes you look in the organization. It's okay, I'll just stick to it and, 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 and coach that person. 
but eventually, well, in case you come across this in the next months, uh, the best thing probably is to just uh, part ways. I think it's it's really hard to yeah, change a person, yeah, sure. as you said before. And when you see something in the beginning, even in, in the early three months, it's probably not going to change afterwards. So yeah. that's a really interesting one. Um, the other part I'm curious about your hiring process is that you see a lot of companies being very obsessed with somebody that has done exactly what they have, what they want to achieve, right? So if you're a, whatever, a tracking software, you're like, I want somebody that comes from Google Analytics or somebody that comes from doing exactly the same thing. But you guys are pretty groundbreaking in that regard, right? Like there's not a lot of people that will have that exact background. How much of an emphasis you put at like that industry specific skills and knowledge versus people that are just overall the right fit? So one thing that is super important for our work is uh, a lot of expertise in the science of climate change. Uh, mm -hmm. We've secured this by setting up a, a climate uh, change team, a science team uh, that has been there since the beginning of planning. Um, and they have really niche experience that is exactly related to carbon accounting, that is exactly related to carbon reduction, people with PhDs on the topic, um, expertise in certification, expertise in reporting uh, from World Bank, UN, and so on. Uh, so this is where we've been really particular and specific in terms of hiring. Uh, mm -hmm. For the rest, it's at the end of the day a SaaS product. So what we have needed is a CTO that understands really well how to deal with like a lot of data, how to deal with uh, um, machine learning. Um, we even have the benefit of him having expertise in blockchain. So there's even elements for testing other uh, types of technologies. Uh, so we are always looking for people that are really experts in their topic, but there's no expectation that we're going to hire a product manager that has worked in a carbon accounting yeah. software. Um, but the product manager that works with a lot of data, we have one. Uh, a, a product manager that works with uh, um, software as a service products, we have that one. So and this is kind of the way we've been thinking about it, uh, specific knowledge to the specific uh, topic uh, and challenge that is ahead of us, which is building a software as a service platform for carbon accounting and reporting. The one thing that's really interesting to me is that in a few times in the conversation, we've said, well, it is another SaaS business, right? It's just another SaaS business. But I can imagine that if you're really passionate about the mission, then you forget that sometimes. Uh, in, in your yeah. job as a CEO, have you forgotten that sometimes? Have you been like just like completely, for example, making decisions that are not the best for your SaaS metrics, but they are the best mm -hmm. for the environment or whatnot, right? That, that when, I don't know how you guys are funded or, or whatever, but at some point, if you get more money in or something, then you're going to need to become more of a CEO than a planet saver. Have you been in that position where you forget about it sometimes and, and go Captain Planet before going a CEO? Mm -hmm. I'm Captain Planet on a daily basis, and I don't think I need to be less of a CEO to be also Captain Planet. Um, I think the world is going through this transition now that is trying to understand uh, how is it even possible to build a business that is focused on profit but is also doing uh, things for the environment. We have a huge benefit that uh, I as a CEO, my co-founder, uh, and basically the whole Planet team is super well educated about what problem we're solving. Uh, we don't work with people that have been um, kind of, you know, uh, unfamiliar with the topic of climate change before joining Plan A. Uh, not everyone has been super sustainable before they joined Plan A. That's totally fine. Not everyone is vegan on the team or something like that. <laughs> uh, I'm not vegan, uh, or, but we have all alignment around the fact that uh, we have a mission to support businesses on being the key element to addressing climate change. Um, when it comes to my decision-making, uh, given my background as business and finance, I kind of uh, have this uh, connotation, this uh, perspective every single day. Uh, mm -hmm. But I have a lot of compassion and empathy, which allows me uh, to be really clear on what is kind of the balance between uh, having the planet always in the back of my mind while also building a sustainable business. Um, and I don't believe it's impossible. Uh, the results we've been able to achieve uh, within this uh, short amount of time are validation for this. And anyone that is listening that is building a business uh, which is 
somewhat related to the uh, to any space actually, not even the impact space. Uh, you can always do good. Uh, there doesn't need to be a trade-off uh, that makes uh, maybe makes you uh, successful, but uh, kind of empty, shallow uh, business person. There's always a possibility to have um, impact uh, and to be good to the planet and also hopefully to the people that you work with as well. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a really positive message, right? I think that a lot of CEOs forget that often that that it doesn't have to be one or the other. Right, and that sometimes it's also okay to take a little bit of a hit on the on the business side if if it is gonna pay off eventually in the longer term with with being good to people or the environment or so on. So that that's a super nice message. Uh, coming back to hiring, to to wrap that up, is there any particular part of hiring that it's the most difficult for you of the whole process? Mm, not really. Uh, I mean, we do like really standard and also not so standard things. Like we do tests, we do culture fit, we do. Uh, uh, kind of uh, having a coffee with a big chunk of the team uh, when COVID obviously is not uh, the case. Otherwise, it happens online. Um, so there's a lot of elements we've included, and I haven't developed this only myself. We also have a people manager uh, uh, who is really, really capable with this topic uh, and really educated on the topic. Uh, so there's nothing in particularly difficult. I think I have a very good like uh, sense for people. Uh, I yeah. can quite quickly understand if they uh, are empathetic, if they're committed, if they're going to be um, willing to uh, to work with others, uh, to be collaborative. Uh, and uh, as the process is also not uh, only driven by me, there's other people that also contribute to the final decision. Uh, and uh, there's also uh, kind of, a lot of alignment at the end of the day before we decide to, to hire someone. Um, I'm still heavily engaged with hiring and I probably will be until uh, as long as I can. Yeah. Because I think it's super important to uh, have a com connection with these people before they've even joined. Uh, uh, I don't want anyone to kind of show up on their first day and not know me not know what drives the company, how we started and so on, because that is their way, uh, that, that is a way for them to increase their commitment as well. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's why I think a lot of people believe that, you know, over a certain amount of, of employees, then you need to just let go of those functions and so on as a CEO, but that couldn't be more wrong. I mean, the, the, the more people are related to the business, the, the better it will be for everybody. So the other one, uh, it's a more a bit of a more personal topic, right? Which was uh, finding time for yourself that, that we came across. So in that one, um, you just were mentioning at the beginning, I've had a lot of guests that think that to make a business successful, um, it's you have to go all in. There's no other way, right? Some people believe that you just have to have no life. You have to like give up everything, have zero family time. And that is the only way to be successful. How do you feel about that? Do you agree? Or are you even willing to go to that extent uh, as this business grows? I think I've already gone to this extent. I mean, yeah. uh, but, uh, except for the fact that I do have a, a fantastic personal life in terms of, you know, I'm happy, I'm uh, committed, and uh, uh, I dedicate a lot of time to my relationship. But uh, when it comes to working hours, it's just mental. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I, I, I know that this is not... Uh, a, a, healthy and I don't give this as an advice to anyone um, but it's quite exciting to be seeing results from your work and then this kind of motivates you to work further but there's kind of the side effect that you end up maybe working a bit too much and um, not eating always healthy not uh, doing enough sports um, if you're in for the long run, if you really want to build something that lasts, you have to ma manage your uh, capacities as well. Yeah. Uh, this year, I definitely have uh, given a lot of my time uh, to the company, and I'm super happy because it has driven a lot of amazing results, and we have amazing people that have joined the company. We have stability financially and so on. Uh, so it has paid off, but uh, I am definitely finishing 2020 with a uh, commitment to uh, develop a few new hobbies and uh, do uh, sports basically four times a week. So uh, 
you can check me on that at the end of 2021. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have to share your, your stats uh, with the listeners of the podcast, your uh, running Absolutely, stats yeah. and everything. Okay, <laughs> cool. What about, you know, because, yeah, I mean, in general, people are passionate about their businesses. That's why they start them. But you're particularly passionate about it because, it's, yeah, it just has an impact on humanity as a whole, right? It's such a bigger issue than just, I don't know, I love marketing or whatever, right? It's just much more important. Do you think that also affects that, that, you know, like when you're thinking about putting in that extra hour, that extra four hours, you're just always thinking like, I could make an impact or do you, is, is the environment that's pushing you in that direction? Is it the business? How, do you think it gives you that extra push as well? There's a bit of a, a problem that I've created for myself that uh, in the spare time that I find for myself and uh, that I'm at home, I uh, quite often dedicated to further educating myself about climate change and watching documentaries, reading books about it, yeah. which kind of gets me even more stirred up and I want to be doing more. Uh, I, I guess uh, there's a mm, there's a level of uh, commitment, but mainly there's just a lot of work. Uh, and uh, it's not that I am not able to delegate uh, quite the contrary. I have a fantastic team working really closely with me. Uh, But the problem is that there's just a lot. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think uh, um, there's definitely a few people joining, specifically um, my team and also the sales team, which I work really closely with in the coming months. And maybe the workload is going to decrease or at least like be a bit more balanced. But um, the main reason why I add this extra hour or two or five is uh, because there's just a lot that has to be done. <laughs> What, uh, that's the simple answer. What about your your expectations of employees, right? Because usually in a in a regular business, like yeah, sure, there's a lot of founders that 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 kind of expect that everybody will put in the same hours, and and they're like, well, you know, if if the business gets sold for X million or whatever, they are not the ones getting rich. It's uh, it's you. So it, it's a bit unrealistic to expect that kind of of, of commitment from 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 employees. In your case. You know, maybe your business is not looked at it the same way. You're not looking at it as an exit or like people just getting stock in it or, or IPOing. You're actually having a, a bit of a deeper mission. Uh, what are your expectations with employees? Are, do you expect them that they also pull out the, the all-nighters and that they get used to that rhythm because this is the way it is? Or are you a bit more careful with not burning them out? Uh, uh I want to make uh, it clear because the building a sustainable business and a green tech business doesn't mean that we we can't go for an IPO. True, uh, I was actually, I was actually uh, there's there's I, one that I know here in Amsterdam that's doing it right now. That's a uh, EV box. Yeah, so I was yeah, and yeah. I think it's uh, it's really important to say and to anyone that is building this kind of a business to know that the rules of a normal business apply to you as well. It's not, yeah. uh, and this is what we're aiming for, especially the moment when you get venture capital money in the business, this is kind of part of the deal as well. Uh, so um, we are looking for this uh, kind of uh, growth and development. Uh, when it comes to the expectations from the employees, I am um, expecting the work to be done. Um, and what this means is that there's... Uh, Everyone has a head on their uh, shoulders. They can de define what is the time within which a task has to be done. Uh, but they need to know how to manage their time in order to be uh, successful in the Plan A team. Uh, this is one of the crucial elements uh, that we look for when it comes to uh, new hires. Um, Burnout is something that we don't like, uh, and we actually have a lot of balancing uh, activities, so to say, that are organized by uh, by me, by our people manager, by the operational team, uh, that make sure that the team stays sound and happy uh, on a daily basis. Uh, we always just speak about get your work done, uh, and uh, it kind of, uh, you know, it kind of ends up uh, uh, leading normally to the results that we're looking for um, because we have selected the kind of people that know how to uh, manage their time well, how to learn quickly and to adapt quickly. Um, one thing that is really, uh, I guess, important to mention is that uh, when you are talking of burnout, 
that most likely, or at least the environment in which I've been, where I've seen a lot of burnout, uh, uh, has been the environment where there's not that much of uh, happiness in the company, uh, yeah. where there's uh, too much pressure that comes maybe from the management uh, or some uh, other actors uh, that is not being addressed. Uh, we don't work with this mindset. Uh, we just hire brilliant people and they end up doing uh, amazing work without having to stay overnight in the office, without having to uh, lose their personal relationships. Because uh, uh, at the end of the day, this is uh, something that is going to be coming on our bill at the end of the month if yeah. they start taking a lot of sick days and so on. Um, so there's no benefit in pushing anyone to the edge. Yeah, and also, well, burnout is associated with the amount of work. And, but also it's a, a lot associated with like the results that you get yeah. and, and like not being in control, right? Like if you're putting in really long hours, as you were saying earlier, right? But you're seeing great results and you feel like you're really going somewhere with it, uh, then people are willing to put in those extra hours and you do it with more energy because you're just in it, right? Like, which is very different to doing that when you just feel like you don't control the outcome and the results are not coming in and, you know, and you have this whole feeling of, am I wasting my time here? which is very different than what you guys experienced. But okay, cool. So uh, we're starting to wrap this up. Let me ask you for uh, some resources. So this is a really interesting topic for you in particular because I think in general, most of us, and I did some research, of course, before talking to you, but most of us are really ignorant when it comes to really understanding carbon footprint, right? So uh, it would be really cool to hear from any resources that you uh, have to share with the audience. Yeah. Uh, so there's actually multiple books that have defined, I would say, my, uh, my journey. Uh, the one that I love, uh, and I think it's a really brilliant way to get into the topic, is called How Bad Are Bananas? Uh, <laughs> so it's written, uh, it's a really fantastic book that actually takes you to the day-to-day -day activities that each one of us has, eating an orange, having a banana, um, doing a Google search um, and gives you an analysis of how much CO2 is related to these activities. Uh, it is a simple way for you to start kind of putting numbers behind some of the actions you take on a daily basis. Um, another book that is really uh, fantastic and I think maybe goes a bit too much in the political uh, connotation, but is uh, at the end of the day... Uh, incredibly eye-opening is by Naomi Klein uh, um, and uh, it's basically capitalism versus climate um, yeah. and it explains quite clearly like what are the correlations between human decisions and uh, the decay of our nature of our planet um, and then finally one that is uh, um, one that is a bit more uh, I would say the dramatic statistics kind of... Uh, uh, <laughs> the scary one. You know, yeah, exactly. Um, is uh, the uninhabitable earth. And oh, wow. It's, it's, it does sound uh, scary. <laughs> <laughs> it's by David Wallace Wells, and uh, he's a journalist uh, in the US uh, who has made quite, uh, quite an interesting uh, uh, kind of... Uh, he's gotten quite of an interesting response uh, by different communities because of the book. Um, the book basically takes you through what's happening in the next decade, in the next 20 years, 30 years, uh, if we stay on the same track that we're, st that we're on now. Um, yeah. At the moment, we are on track for a three-degree increase. Uh, and if we stay within the same amount of CO2 emission uh, increase uh this year there's been a decrease but there's an expectation that next year we're going to go back to the usual um we're hitting four degrees in a short amount of time in a few decades so it's a book which can kind of maybe in a dramatic way open your eyes a bit uh yeah i did cry multiple times when i was reading it <laughs> <laughs> well it's necessary um, right like we need to hear the tough stuff to to get to get in on it right the, the first one is for the lighthearted, <laughs> and then the last one is, I guess, the more uh, the more complex one. Cool. I want to share also a couple. There's there's an article by, by a Dutch company. I don't know if you know them. They call EcoChain, uh, and when they talk about the hidden uh, water footprints, which I thought was really interesting because it's one of those things that you never thought of that it takes like a bazillion liters of water to get a Coke can 
made yeah. or things that are just like so simple that you have no idea have any impact. So it's super eye opening. And the other one is is your academy. I, I was reading through the articles in the Planet Academy. I think it's really really nice. I, there's this nice article about you know the impact that ocean data has on really understanding uh, what's going on. That for me was really eye opening. So I would recommend it to everybody. I think in general we have a little bit of as a duty as world citizens to learn more about this. I'm I'm not great at this. I have never been. I'm I'm, I'm uh, but I, I really need to get on it because I think it's it's super fundamental for well. So we keep existing basically. So thank you so much for being here. I really love the conversation and uh, all the best with Plan A. I know you guys are making waves all over the place. Thank you so much for the invitation, Ignacio. And uh, let's hope that 2021 uh, is going to deliver on uh, all the needs for improvement uh, we've been looking for uh, since 2020 hit us in March. Absolutely. Let's hope so. Bye, everybody. To the next episode. Growth Pains. <laughs>